En esta, en esta parte de la sesión del día de hoy vamos a tener breves presentaciones de parte de los expertos titulares de Brasil, Perú y en México respecto de los avances que han eh, realizado en materia de justamente eh, el tema del sector privado en colaboración con el sector público en la lucha contra la corrupción. Eh, vamos, el formato que vamos a seguir para esta jornada de trabajo va a ser primero darles el uso de la palabra a nuestros distinguidos invitados de las representaciones eh, de las organizaciones internacionales y del sector privado. Eh, luego continuamos con una sección de preguntas y respuestas y luego ya venimos con la presentación a cargo de los expertos titulares. Vamos a empezar ahora sí ofreciéndoles el uso de la palabra a la señora Lía Ambler, quien es analista jurídica y gerente de la División Anticorrupción correspondiente a América Latina. No, de... que está por video, pero todavía no está, no está en línea. Así que podemos seguir con la... Con ya. La ¿Quién va a seguir? Perdón. La que sigue es la Inglés. Bueno, me dicen que hay un tema todavía eh, técnico. Vamos a esperar un instante hasta que se conecte eh, o se logre la conexión con eh, la OSD, la señora Lía Ambler. Entonces vamos a continuar en la misma línea de lo previsto y vamos a dar el uso de la palabra a Elaine Desensky. Ella eh, es directora ejecutiva de la Iniciativa de Políticas Estratégicas para las Américas y vicepresidenta ejecutiva de la Asociación de Cámaras. No, 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 no. ella es acá, está acá, directora de las leyes de Ah, Brasil. perdónenme, perdónenme, <risa> hubo un error, discúlpenme. Sí, Elaine Desensky, ella es la directora principal y jefa del PASI del Foro Económico Mundial. Señora Desensky. Thank you very much. Just be uh, the two, two seconds here to bring up the presentation. And I don't see it. Do you want to tell me where the presentation is? Okay, okay I have it. That is OECD. Hold on. Voilà. Yes. Bon. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here. I think this uh, is the first time that the World Economic Forum uh, anti-corruption uh, initiative has been asked to uh, to speak to the OAS. So we were um, very delighted to get this invitation and to talk to you a bit about our work under PACHI, the Partnering Against uh, Corruption Initiative. So what I'd like to talk about today is uh, the, the foundation of PACHI, uh, the imperative for uh, businesses primarily, but working very closely with governments to move towards a corrupt-free level playing field. Um, a bit about the context that drives our work uh, within our anti-corruption efforts. And then finally, uh, some, some thoughts on our initiatives. We have a number of regional initiatives underway and other projects that might be of interest to you. So that's what we'll go through. Um, just uh, to, to, to frame the work of, of PACHI, the, the program started about, um, well, actually more than eight years ago. So in 2004, there was a movement within a number of communities within the World Economic Forum. Uh, we're a Swiss-based foundation. Uh, our membership is primarily comprised of uh, global business uh, businesses and business leaders. We've been around since 1971. So <clears throat> about 30-plus uh, years into the existence of the forum, a number of CEOs uh, comprising our membership came forward to, uh, to ask that we create within the forum a platform for uh, work around anti-corruption. And back in 2004, uh, the, the, the driver behind this initiative was really around compliance. So helping organizations comply with the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is, the, of course, the U.S. legislation that has extraterritorial implications for businesses doing uh, work around the world, and subsequently the U.K. bribery laws, and other legal frameworks uh, that required companies to have a much higher degree of compliance. 
there was also a move by uh, these CEOs to take more of a leadership role, a global leadership role, in setting out uh, some of the key components of what would comprise a level playing field. So how can businesses work together to start to change the environment? And I'll talk a little bit about that as we get into some of the current activities. But the basis for Patchy was in uh, three industries, uh, construction, uh, metals and mining, and energy. So these are three sectors that have had um, traditionally uh, a lot of challenges in dealing with uh, corrupt practices. So there was a drive by a very small group of CEOs uh, together with Transparency International, so a very well-known non-governmental organization, and the Basel Institute, uh, another organization based in Switzerland, to develop the Apache Principles. And the Apache Principles uh, are really based on one core goal, which is zero tolerance for corruption and bribery in all its forms within our member organizations. So when a company signs on to Patchy, the CEO certifies a zero tolerance policy. Uh, and we are, not, we are not an oversight authority per se. We don't have mechanisms for checking up on our CEOs, but by making this public declaration, uh, it's, it's a strong statement. And uh, what we found over the years is this, um, this, this commitment helps set the tone from the top. Um, so uh, when organizations are, uh, are facing issues around uh, bribery, facilitation payments, I mean, you name it, there are many, many challenges out there. Uh, the, the tone from the top makes all the difference uh, in terms of how organizations respond to issues and how they work with each other across industries uh, to start to, uh, to bring about change. So uh, Patchy became a platform not only to improve compliance and ensure that our companies were uh, 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 following the letter of the law and the regulations that applied to them, but also became a global platform to talk about uh, how the business environment needs to change. Uh, much of the work over the first eight years was focused on uh, this issue of compliance, and uh, we uh, published a number of, uh, of uh, resources, for example, uh, guidance on third-party due diligence, uh, handbooks on uh, improving various aspects of compliance within organizations, and this comes from the task force of Apache. So we have about 100 companies who are members, and their chief compliance officers, chief counsel, chief ethics officers comprise the task force that then work on a number of initiatives uh, to help strengthen uh, the, the, the work of, of those companies. Now, more broadly speaking, um, the forum has been an interesting place to, uh, to have this platform and this dialogue because we have quite a, a global visibility. So you may know the forum from our work uh, through the annual meeting in Davos. This is a big uh, meeting where we have leadership coming from business, from government, from civil society. Uh, we come together every year at the end of January. Uh, and it's uh, quite an opportunity to be talking about the major global issues. So coming up in January, we'll actually have quite a focus on on our work around anti-corruption. And I can tell you that uh, from a government perspective, we're getting the strongest interest coming from emerging and frontier markets. So tremendous amount of interest from Southeast Asia, uh, some interest from the Middle East. We've done some work in Latin America. In fact, uh, during our regional meeting in Peru, and Susanna, I think you were involved in that. Uh, there was a very good government business dialogue uh, working uh, with the forum and, and the government of Peru. So um, these opportunities to engage uh, across the regions and uh, at a very high level uh, at our annual meeting uh, comprise some of the best opportunities to get that message out there in the right way. Um, just a bit more about our regional activities. We've been active in a number of areas around the world. Uh, probably our most visible activity is in Mongolia. Uh, where uh, we've been working very closely with members of the extractive industry, so companies involved in metals and mining. Uh, the initiative there was really started by the government of Mongolia. They asked us to come in to create uh, a local patchy network where we would ask uh, Mongolian companies to sign on to our zero tolerance policy, and in effect they would become a local community uh, utilizing the principles of patchy, but applying it in the local context. So this has been a very interesting uh, 
uh, beta test, if you will. It was the first time that we tried this idea of launching a local network. Uh, from uh, from our, our work in, in Switzerland, our engagement with the Mongolians is really around providing tools, um, technical resources. We have an upcoming summit in Mongolia where we're going to be talking about some of the work that they're doing locally. But it's very much to push the principles out at the local level. Um, we don't run these things from Geneva. We really can't, and that's not the idea. It's really to have the multiplier effect. So to be able to take some of the work that we do, working with global business, and then make it available uh, to, to regions and, and countries who are interested. We have some other examples of having worked in uh, Jordan, and I mentioned Peru. Uh, we had a big meeting in India, in Delhi, about five months ago. And it was really the first time that we had um, a very, very open conversation between business and government around some of the key issues that are plaguing uh, growth and competitiveness. And uh, it started a, a very interesting uh, cooperation uh, across uh, different organizations and people that probably wouldn't have otherwise been connected. And what we're seeing across these regional discussions, and maybe you see it too in your work, is a bit of a tipping point. Because there's so much societal discontent with the status quo around processes and uh, programs and uh, spending that seems to be plagued by uh, lack of transparency, by uh, lack of um, sometimes ethical behavior, that um, people are getting tired of that. And in India, for, for certain, we see it. Um, and social media is, is pushing a lot of that discontent into a more public space. So that's one trend uh, that's uh, causing, I think, more people to come to the table. Secondly is this issue uh, around what I would call um, lack of plausible deniability. So for CEOs who operate in emerging and frontier markets, so particularly for US and European-based firms, they're operating in India, uh, they're still subject to the rules and, and legislation of their home country. So it doesn't matter where they're doing business, they must ascribe to a certain uh, level of, of transparency and uh, ethical behavior. Um, so what does this do? It creates a very interesting marketplace where global business, uh, sometimes competing with local business, operate in on different planes and different rules. Uh, so this this is something that um, that is propelling business to say we'd like to see a much more level playing field uh, so that we're in effect not at a competitive disadvantage for having um, a higher degree of transparency within within that organization. Uh, so, so there are a lot of interesting trends and drivers right now that we think are pushing this to a tipping point and I, I'm sure you see that in your work as well and what we're trying to do is really take our work within Apache to the next level to be able to, uh, in, to have an impact in a different way. And it really moves us beyond uh, what we've been doing from a compliance perspective to uh, to the level playing field conversation. And that really guides our work and the current focus on collective action, which is um, getting companies to really work together across sectors to be able to uh, create new rules for engagement. So, for example, infrastructure is one, uh, one sector uh, where there's been quite a bit of interest in this energy, um, uh, healthcare to a certain extent, where companies will, in fact, um, decide that um, they all want to be part of an open procurement process. And that then guides um, the work of their uh, strategic uh, investment and working, working with the governments that might be involved in this. And it's a very powerful thing when companies can come to the table to set out uh, that sort of expectation. Uh, but we're really at the early stages of collective action, what it means, how it can help influence uh, the, the operating environment. And frankly, there's a lot of work to be done. It's not an easy thing to do. And for those of you who've worked on collective action pro uh, projects, you know that. Uh, so um, so it's, um, it's, it's a very bold step, but it's something that takes time. So that's one one issue, and then the other the other thing I wanted to mention is thinking about our our work in the forum and and the global perspective that we we take on our work. Uh, one thing that has really uh, come to come to light over the last year or two is the number of anti-corruption initiatives that are underway, and there's a tremendous amount of good work being done. Uh, whether it's at the World Bank, the OECD, I and mean, we have some tremendous partners out there, and the forum works very closely with uh, with pretty much all of them. I mean, I think in, in our conversations with our partners and with our members, uh, we've all commented on this notion that there's some fragmentation. And uh, as, in as much as there are many, many good ideas and activities 
and investments being made, we might be able to get more bang for the buck if we had more coordination across this across this scope of work. So how we define the scope is, is the question, uh, whether it's at the global level or maybe working at the regional level or across, across industries or some combination of that. But we're very interested in this idea of alignment around major initiatives and really understanding from a risk perspective what needs to be done. So if we were to create a, a list of the top five quote unquote levers for change, if we were looking at uh, the idea of, of creating a much more um, uh, a, a fairer set of market conditions, what would those five objectives be from the business community's perspective? And how would we begin to use that as a discussion point, as a dialogue to help guide investment in the way that businesses and governments uh, engage um, together with, with other international organizations? So this idea of getting a, a greater sense of alignment, uh, being able to guide investment in the future based on which regions uh, may be ripe for certain types of change uh, when it comes to transparency and and again, those fair market conditions that we're looking for. So uh, we're, we're starting this process of transformation mapping. That's what we call it. So how do we begin to map across a global, a regional, and an industry perspective where there's the most potential for change, uh, what those levers for change might look like, and then how we can work together uh, across the spectrum of interested parties, um, the coalition of the willing, if you will, uh, to start uh, getting more impact for the investment that we're making. So um, one, one more thought m more from the, from the global perspective, uh, it's around the, 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 the context. So we do uh, quite a bit of work in the World Economic Forum around global competitiveness. And this is something actually that guided some of our conversations in Peru, where we looked at, uh, for example, uh, the business perceptions around the incidence of corruption and bribery uh, within uh, the Latin America region to understand how it ranked as a business impediment uh, from the business community's perspective. And I think we just got the new data back. So I think it's somewhere between 23 and 27 countries would rank corruption, and again, from the business perspective, as the most, um, uh, the highest impediment to doing business in a particular country. All of this data is available and be very happy to, to share that with you if you're interested in the ranking of your particular country. Uh, we have a number of questions in uh, a survey that we issue every year to uh, businesses around the world. It comprises the, the, the base of our global competitiveness uh, survey, which um, ranks countries according to many different issues. But we have lots of data around issues of uh, transparency and proxies for understanding uh, the level of corruption within, uh, within, a, within a country. Now, it's perception data. So it's based on what people think. Um, measuring that in a quantitative way is a very difficult thing to do. But perception sometimes is reality. So it's interesting to, to look at that data. So uh, that's context for the, the, this slide where uh, we uh, wanted to take a closer look not only at the issue of the link between corruption and competitiveness and how this was affecting uh, the ability of countries to move forward with strong economic growth and uh, and the right sort of investment, uh, and and also to look at it from the perspective of connectivity. So is corruption um, linked to other issues that plague either uh, the global environment or at the country level? So for example, what is the connection between corruption and global governance failure? What is the connection between infrastructure neglect and corruption. So these are the sorts of, of um, connections that we measured through yet another survey uh, through our global risk report, where we wanted to see what the top connection points were between corruption and a range of global risks. Uh, that data is also available online. I won't go into the details, but it is quite interesting to see. And it, it, what it does is it broadens the conversation around what we're talking about, that this is not an issue that stands alone in a silo. Uh, and it's not something that can be solved by simply looking at a very narrow range of tools and issues and policies. It's something that actually permeates the environment in which we live and work and has connectivity to uh, many other issues that we're dealing with, whether it's uh, from a business perspective or, or from, the, from the public sector. Okay, we've covered this. Uh, so uh, Apache, um, in, in terms of its evolution, is moving to this discussion around the level playing field and really thinking about corruption as a strategic business risk. 
this is also quite a change. Um, yes, corruption is absolutely a problem for society. It has implications for, um, for, um, for every member of society. But from a business perspective, what gets CEOs to the table? It's thinking about the impact of corruption on their investments. That's, that's what the challenge is. That's uh, beyond the compliance issue, which is always a concern. Um, but from a strategic perspective, it's really thinking about emerging markets and the risk associated with lack of transparency. Okay, so that leads us to a change in the narrative in terms of how we talk about what we do. So we go from this uh, discussion around loss and risk as it relates to corruption to a narrative of value creation. So if we can move towards transparency, if we can move towards the level playing field, that's a value creation. That's a very positive message. We all want to be about that, about competitiveness, about economic growth, uh, about providing the right sort of sustainable environment for the right sort of investments. Uh, and uh, we have to deal with the issue of corruption and, and, and lack of transparency in order to get there. So uh, this, uh, this context then uh, brings together uh, CEO level leadership. I mentioned our annual meeting in Davos where we'll have uh, many CEOs coming together to talk about how to set uh, and, and what the strategic priorities will be for the, for the next couple of years under the work with Apache. So we're excited about that. We're launching a new um, community called Apache Vanguard. So these are the CEOs who are highly committed and uh, want the global visibility of taking a leadership role around anti-corruption and, and a level playing field. And uh, so this group is really a group of champions and we think that uh, will uh, be something interesting uh, for, the, for the global media when we get together in January. So as we move forward, uh, we're going to be continuing to work with our, our partners at the OECD, at the World Bank, uh, the UN Global Compact. Uh, we find that there's tremendous opportunity to, um, to leverage the work that uh, everyone is doing. Uh, our um, strategic angle within the forum is really the CEO level leadership. So that's the, that's the piece that um, we're going to be working on quite a bit and how to bring uh, that leadership to the table. And then we're uh, also uh, working on a project we call, kind of as a working title, Designing Corruption Out of the System. So going back to that idea of what are the core levers that really start to build that change in the marketplace, and then how do we use that as a mechanism for creating the right agenda for, uh, for a group of committed companies and, and CEOs through the forum. So that's, uh, that's a brief introduction to our work within Patchy. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions a bit later uh, and uh, would also be happy to stay in contact with you and put you in touch with uh, various resources that could be um, useful and relevant to your work. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Elaine. Vamos a continuar. A ver si preguntemos a ver si, si está conectado. Podemos conectarnos, no sé si están los señores de la... ¿Podemos conectarnos con Lía? Todavía. Bueno, vamos a continuar entonces. Ah, discúlpeme. Eh, las preguntas, eh, El Salvador, las, las pre si es que tuviera una pregunta, hemos quedado al inicio de la, de la presentación de nuestros invitados que las preguntas las vamos a hacer al término de las intervenciones de todos ellos. Realmente era una cuestión bien sencilla. I'm um, sí. um, sorry, I guess I should be speaking English or I, I don't know if we have translation capabilities right now. In any case, um, I, I, my, my only question was, if whether there is a, uh, a parameter in terms of corruption in the uh, competitiveness index that the World Economic Forum has. Sorry, that was my only question. Estimado eh, experto, colega de El Salvador, vamos a seguir la, la, el protocolo conforme lo habíamos planteado. Al final de las intervenciones de nuestros, de nuestros invitados, vamos a hacer todas las preguntas y su pregunta de todas maneras queda y eh, Elaine obviamente la va a responder. Será una de las primeras que responda. Okay. Muchas gracias. Sí, la respuesta es sí. Bueno, muy rápidamente. Patrick, ¿no? Entonces, después de ahí, entonces sería Patrick Kilbride. Ok, acá. Ya, yeah, sí. Bueno, vamos a continuar entonces. Vamos a cederle el uso de la palabra al señor Patrick 
Kilbright, eh, director ejecutivo de la Iniciativa de Políticas Estratégicas para las Américas y vicepresidente ejecutivo de la Asociación de Cámaras de Comercio de Latinoamérica. Por favor. Perdón. Gracias, Susana. Uh, con permiso, uh, hablaría en inglés uh, porque mi español uh, no es muy bueno. Um, with your permission, uh, I'll, I'll continue in English. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I just want to clarify, uh, we are affiliated with the Center for International Private Enterprise, but different organizations. Um, So what I'd like to talk with you uh, about today is a relatively new project of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's international division that was launched in 2010, and this is our Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets. And, of course, it, uh, you know, I think uh, Elaine's comments were, were very relevant to, uh, to the work we're doing, I, and I expect uh, knowing a little bit about the world, work of the World Bank in this area that you'll see a lot of commonality there as well. So let me start by answering the question of why a business-specific uh, coalition on the rule of law. We, we found uh, in working with our, our members uh, operating overseas that, um, you know, 10, 10, 15 years ago, our emphasis was on issues of market access. How do companies get into global markets? How do they, uh, you know, simply get their goods across the border? You know, can we eliminate the tariff barriers, the quotas, and those things? We quickly found, as we were more successful in entering uh, markets worldwide, that the real issues were in terms of market efficiencies and market governance. And in fact, th that it was in this third area of market governance, looking forward, where there was the most opportunity for both the private sector and uh, the public sector to gain efficiencies and to promote economic growth and create jobs, the things that, that we do together so well. So when we looked at this issue of market governance for business, we found there, there was a tremendous amount of uh, very impressive work being done, but that the field was very broad and that the specific areas where business perhaps needed help were being lost in the conversation and perhaps not addressed at all. Um, we found that where uh, our companies were running into challenges that involved the rule of law, they tended to be very specific either to a company or an industry. They tended to be uh, highly politicized, so, you know, not lending themselves to, you know, sort of a, an easy process resolution, but instead involving public affairs and political interventions. And so, and we found that the circumstances uh, were often very isolating. So one company would be in a very difficult position that, that wasn't necessarily shared with other companies or industries. And so what we set out to do was to create a collective voice for business where we could begin to show fact patterns that represented uh, different rule of law considerations, and we could speak uh, with one voice on behalf of the business community. So the link to corruption. Um, rule of law, of course, is, is more than just corruption, and, and we um, we didn't want to get pulled into a conversation that was strictly about bribery. Um, but we recognize that this is a, one of the framing pieces of, of the rule of law conversation. And so as we looked at this, we, we, we saw really two ways uh, to fight corruption. The one is deterrence, is pun punishing uh, corruption, both on the provider and the demandeur side. Um, and it, you know, it involves all the types of compliance measures that companies go through to make sure that they're not guilty of corruption. Um, but where we, we, we saw a great deal of work being done in that area already, and so where we wanted to focus our efforts was on the flip side of the coin in terms of prevention. And, and Elaine, I think you were getting to this towards the end in terms of, in terms of uh, designing uh, corruption out of the system. So we wanted to be able to work with countries in a proactive way It helps them uh, identify best practices that reduce the opportunities for corruption by narrowing, uh, in many cases, discretion for public officials. So that can be through process, 
through automation, through transparency, but taking discretionary ability out of the hands of, uh, of public officials where it's not needed and narrowing down those opportunities uh, in that way. When we looked at the areas where, where we thought the business community needed specific help, we identified five factors. And those were transparency, predictability, stability, accountability, and due process. And these are, first of all, you know, the idea that laws and regulations applied to business should be easily accessible and, and readily understood. Um, that they, there should be predictability, that if you uh, go to one port of entry, you're going to face the same treatment from the customs director as you would at another port of entry in the same country. Third, uh, stability, and, and this is one of the more controversial, not controversial, I should say, but maybe uh, not intuitive aspects. We think that there should be a cohesiveness in the way governments approach the regulation of business over time so that there's not uh, radical shifts in policy, that there's not retroactive behavior, that there's a certain obvious trend, uh, which, which leaves room, of course, for changes in policy over time, but that gives uh, the business community a clear sense of direction as to what it can expect from a country's governance. Fourth, uh, in terms of accountability, uh, investors should have the confidence that the laws will be enforced, that they'll be enforced to, uh, to the same degree uh, when it comes to the competition as it does to your own business, and that public officials will be held accountable in the same way that private actors are. And fifth, uh, in terms of due process, that is when uh, there are disputes, and there are always inevitably disputes, that's the nature of the world, that there should be fair predetermined processes that govern the resolution of those disputes. And so with those five factors in mind, we set out to define uh, a project that would help us advocate in terms of best practices uh, and the vehicles to implement those best practices around the world. Um, so our, our definition for the rule of law to help shape our efforts was pretty simple. It was that we, we needed to see strong, efficient government institutions that were accountable, that had the uh, authority to issue, enforce, and adjudicate market governing rules, that the process was transparent, predictable, and predetermined, and that it provided legal certainty for all aspects of economic activity. So with that definition in mind, then we set out to, to see how we could measure rule of law for business with the idea, you know, and Elena will recognize, you know, CEOs always tell us if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we said, well, how do we measure rule of law for business? Um, some of the elements suggested by our definition, first of all, we can uh, measure uh, the strength of government institutions uh, through, uh, through reports such as the World Economic Forum's uh, index. We can look at governmental efficiency. We can look at the strength of checks and balances, the legal basis for rulemaking authority, and other, other aspects of governance as it applies to those five factors that I mentioned before. A lot of this is, falls in the category of, uh, of the intangibles. Uh, and fortunately, there's a great deal of work that's already in the public sphere in terms of capturing these intangibles. In some cases, it's empirical, and in some cases, it's uh, perceptions. But because there's so much of it out there, our feeling was that if you could find a way to aggregate uh, this information, that you could, with a reasonable degree of confidence, draw some conclusions. So what we uh, set, set out to do uh, about a year ago was to develop a global business rule of law dashboard. And uh, we looked at a series of reports and indices. Uh, I mentioned World Economic Forum's work, uh, the World Bank's Doing Business Report, the uh, World Justice uh, Project's Rule of Law Index, and a number of others. And so we set out to do three things, to map, extract, and combine. We wanted to see, first of all, what was being measured and how relevant it was to business according to the definition that we had applied. Then we wanted to extract the most business-specific indicators from those index indices to be able to say, okay, you know, for instance, you've measured uh, a thousand different criteria related to rule of law or governmental efficiency or, or various other uh, categories. We're going to take out of those thousand, we're going to take the 50 that we believe are most specific to the business environment and try to uh, pull a score out of that. And then we're going to do the same 
across uh, you know, about a dozen other uh, indices and reports. Um, and then with that tool in hand, then we're going to help those organizations identify gaps to be able to say, if you ask this question, you might uh, zero in on, uh, you know, on a score that's even more relevant to business. So our expected findings, um, we uh, initially looked at 12 uh, indices or measures. Uh, I, I mentioned a few of them already. I won't bore you with the list, but there are some of the more uh, prominent uh, and respected uh, organizations that are measuring in this area. And then, you know, you can see as we compared this to our definition, uh, the top, you know, the World Justice Project, which, which really does a, a very comprehensive index, we found that some 40% of their uh, of their criteria were very specific to what we wanted to capture for the business environment, and you know it went from there. Um, so what we do now with this, we want to be able to to advocate for best practices with governments. We want to be able to point to, you know, uh, some sort of uh, empirical third-party validated aggregate score that we can do and we want to uh, be able to help countries that are looking to improve their competitiveness through the rule of law to do exactly that and so whether it's through free trade agreements commercial law treaties bilateral investment treaties or, or any host of other vehicles we want to work with partners around the world to help them take the steps that will give them the most bang for their buck in working for business and attracting quality investment to their markets because it's our strong conviction that it's only uh, through a strong rule of law that the best companies are going to come and invest for the long term in any given market and that the companies or the, excuse me the countries that are uh, proactively focusing in this area are going to reap uh, a lot of benefits in the long term so uh, this is um, this is a project that's actually just being completed now. We're going to uh, we're going to share preliminary or final results of the study at the uh, meeting of the Association of American Chambers of Commerce in Latin America uh, on September 30th here in Washington at the U.S. Chamber, and uh, we'll publish the results shortly thereafter. And hope to have it available uh, soon after that to share with all of you. And we hope that it will be uh, a point of entry to. Uh, to a productive partnership with uh, with all willing partners. Thanks very much. Thank you. Trabajar con ella para las. Ya, sí. Muchas gracias a Patrick eh, por su presentación. Ahora sí estamos conectados eh, con Lia Ambler. De la OSD, vamos a, a. ¿Estamos ya? Oh. Bien, ahora sí, ya estamos. Con... Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Sí, estamos con Lía Ambler. Permítanme presentarlas a ustedes. Ella es analista jurídica y gerenta de la División Anticorrupción correspondiente a América Latina de la Organización para la Cooperación y el Desarrollo. Ella hará su, su presentación desde París. Eh, ya estamos conectados. Lía, ¿nos escuchas bien? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, everyone? Sí. sí. Eh, te estamos escuchando, Lía. Eh, sí, Lía, te estamos escuchando. Hello, can you hear me? Sí, Lía, te estamos escuchando. De repente hay un problema con el sonido. Okay, excellent. I'll, I'll start my presentation and, and I apologize for the, the delay in my connection earlier. We had a few technical difficulties. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, to finally join you uh, by video conference for this panel discussion uh, with colleagues from other international organizations on the question of the responsibility of the private sector in preventing and combating corruption. Now, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm very grateful to our colleagues at the OAS Secretariat for making it possible for me to join you remotely, uh, if somewhat belatedly, and for organising and hosting this discussion. 
Now, in terms of in introductions, I'm one of a team of around 12 legal analysts who work in the OECD's anti-corruption division. And our main task is to monitor states' parties' implementation of the OECD anti-bribery convention. Now, this monitoring work is a key mandate of the OECD Working Group on Bribery, which is comprised of the now 40 states' parties to the convention. Seven of those countries are from the Americas, namely Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and the US, and more should be joining soon. I'm also responsible for the Working Group's outreach program called the OECD Latin America Anti-Corruption Program. Under this program, we partner with the OAS Secretariat and the Inter-American Development Bank to identify areas where we can work together to strengthen the fight against corruption in our respective member countries. And for this reason, I'm delighted to join you here today for my very first MESASIC meeting. The Americas are home to some of the largest and fastest growing economies in the world, and much of this growth is spurred on by the expansion of the private sector into foreign markets. However, with increased exposure to foreign markets comes, of course, the increased risk of corruption. If we can go on to the, the second slide. Bribery, bribery increases the cost of doing business, and such costs cannot necessarily be passed on and are only recuperated through the delivery of substandard products. Now, this is unsustainable for companies in increasingly competitive, globalised markets. In addition, small and medium-sized companies are at a disadvantage when they cannot afford to pay the bribes offered by their competitors. Now, how can we help companies avoid these risks and fully benefit from their international business dealings? Today, I'll provide an overview of two main tools that the OECD Working Group on Bribery has developed to assist companies to prevent and combat corruption. And those are specifically the OECD Good Practice Guidance on Internal Controls, Ethics and Compliance, and a, a study that the OECD helped produce for the G20 Anti-Corruption Working Group on whistleblower protection. Now, at the governmental level, the OECD works to level the playing field by requiring governments to criminalise bribery in international business. We do this via the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention. It's the first and only international legally binding instrument that focuses exclusively on the supply side of bribery in international business. Its aim is to cut off bribes to foreign public officials so that companies can operate on a level playing field. Countries that are a party to the convention must prosecute individuals who offer, promise, or give bribes to foreign public officials and subject them to penalties including heavy fines or prison time. Companies must also be sanctioned. Now, to give you an indication of the success of the work that the, the success that this work has had to date. Active bribery of foreign public officials is now a crime in the 40 states parties to the convention, and bribes, believe it or not, are no longer a tax-deductible expense. In addition, since the entry into force of the convention in 1999, 216 individuals and 90 companies have been sanctioned in 13 of the member countries of the OECD Working Group on Bribery. 320 investigations are currently underway in, two, in 24 states parties. Now, the fight against corruption cannot be won by governments alone. Companies are also on the front line in this fight. If we can move on to the next slide, please. In 2010, the OECD adopted a new good practice guidance to help companies prevent and protect themselves from the effects of transnational bribery. It is the first and only intergovernmental guidance of its kind. The Good Practice Guidance responds to the need for companies to put in place more effective preventive measures against bribery in international business. This is true for companies of all sizes, including SMEs, which are increasingly conducting business across borders. That is why the guidance was designed in a way that could be adaptable depending on a company's size, geographic location or business area. What is important is that companies recognise there are fundamental elements that, at a minimum, could make up the heart of any effective anti-corruption compliance program. And these are outlined in the guidance. If we can move to the next slide, please. 
An effective anti-bribery compliance program includes a clearly articulated and visible corporate anti-bribery policy that applies to individuals at all levels of the company, including subsidiaries, and oversight of the policy by one or more senior corporate officers with an adequate level of autonomy from the senior management. It also includes due diligence measures with regard to business partners and a system of financial and accounting procedures designed to ensure fair and accurate bookkeeping. Next slide, please. Now, we all know that actions speak louder than words. The guidance emphasizes that a written and publicly available program is not enough. Companies should undertake periodic training at all levels, including on procedures for internal and confidential reporting as well as appropriate disciplinary procedures to address violations of the anti-bribery policy. Finally, the guidance addresses the essential role played by business organisations and professional associations in assisting companies, in particular small and medium-sized enterprises, in the development of effective internal controls, ethics and compliance programs. This role includes the dissemination of information on foreign bribery issues, making available tools and providing advice on training, prevention and due diligence, and providing general advice and support on measures to resist extortion and solicitation. The guidance is available on the OECD website in both English and Spanish, so I would encourage you to make use of it and to raise awareness among the private sector in your countries of its usefulness for them in developing their own internal anti-bribery compliance systems. Next slide, please. Another important tool in preventing and combating corruption in the private sector is the system for whistleblower protection. Now this can take the form of specific legislation uh, enacted by governments and also internal mechanisms put in place by companies. There's no universal definition for whistleblower protection and a number of definitions are provided under the various international law and anti-corruption instruments such as the UNCAC and the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention. Now the definition set out in my presentation, and I'm not sure if you have the right slide, but it, it, it has extracted the common elements found in a number of these instruments to frame a definition in the context of corruption. Namely, protection from discriminatory or disciplinary action uh, public and private sector employees who report in good faith and on reasonable grounds, suspicions of corruption to competent authorities. Now, it's integral, uh, the, the, the promotion of whistleblower protection is integral to efforts to combat corruption and support a clean business environment. Whistleblower protection mechanisms encourage the reporting of misconduct, fraud, and corruption, and the risk of corruption is significantly heightened in environments where whistleblowers are not protected. Protecting private sector whistleblowers facilitates the reporting of active bribery and other corrupt acts committed by companies. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Whistleblower protection laws will include mechanisms to protect individuals who blow the whistle. Depending on how comprehensive a law is, this may include protection against workplace reprisals, which should not be limited to dismissal but also demotions, transfers, refusals of promotion, decrease in security clearance, and other more subtle forms of workplace retaliation. Protection can also be provided by ensuring that whistleblowers do not face civil or criminal liability for disclosing information, including defamation or libel suits. Now, one example uh, of legislation that's been enacted along these lines is careers protection of public interest whistle, the, the, the Korean Protection of Public Interest Whistleblowers Act, which very comp comprehensively provides for protection against civil and criminal liability. Protection can also be provided in the form of allowing anonymous reporting, as well as reversing the burden of proof, such that the onus is actually on the employer to show that the action taken against a whistleblower would have taken place even if the whistleblower did not make the report. Whistleblower protection mechanisms will also include reporting procedures. These can vary from prescribed channels through which the disclosure should be made in order to, uh, in order to benefit from the afforded protection. For whistleblowing in certain sectors, this may involve reporting internally first within the company before going external outside the organisation to the competent authorities. 
Whistleblower protection mechanisms should also allow for the possibility of making external disclosures to the media or civil society, for example. Telephone, hot, uh, telephone hotlines or email addresses which have, have proved to be an efficient and effective way of handling reports and also allowing for anonymity and confidentiality. Some countries have chosen to provide, to go even further, to provide financial incentives to encourage whistleblowing. For example, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act in the US allows whistleblowers under certain circumstances to obtain a share of the funds that are recovered as a result of their whistleblowing. Korea's whistleblower protections uh, also allow a reward and financial incentive system. Some view such incentives as controversial, but other countries are considering adopting similar provisions to encourage the reporting of unlawful conduct, especially in view of the high risks that whistleblowers face. Whistleblower protection mechanisms should have strong enforcement, particularly where a whistleblower who has faced retaliation can have his case heard by an independent or external body. Allowing whistleblowers to have a genuine day in court is important in this regard. And in the US and the UK, for example, whistleblowers can avail themselves of judicial review under a court of appeals or employment tribunal, respectively. Comprehensive enforcement mechanisms should also ensure that whistleblowers who have faced retaliation are adequately compensated. This may include not only compensation for lost salary, but also compensatory damages for suffering. Some countries have also enacted legislation that allows for employers to be sanctioned in cases uh, when they have retaliated against whistleblowers, and such sanctions can include fines or imprisonment. For example, the US Sarbanes-Oxley Act can impose a criminal penalty of up to 10 years imprisonment on an employer who retaliates against a whistleblower who reveals a violation of any criminal act to law enforcement authorities. These examples and more are all contained in the G20 study on whistleblower protection, which is, was produced uh, with the assistance of the OECD. So I would encourage you to consult that study, which brings together a compendium of best practices in whistleblower protection legislation, and also uh, some in important insight on internal mechanisms that can be put in place by companies to protect uh, whistleblowers and also to facilitate internal reporting. Creating an organisational culture of transparency which supports whistleblowing uh, is, a very, is very important in preventing and combating corruption. This can be done by setting the tone from the top within an organisation, that whistleblowing is encouraged and that it should be seen as an act of loyalty to a company or institution rather than disloyalty. So I hope that the, today's overview of these two tools that the OECD has developed to help companies prevent and combat corruption has been useful for you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. And uh, I understand that my presentation will be made available uh, following the meetings this week. So thank you very much again for your attention. Muchas gracias a ti, Lia. Te pedimos que te mantengas. Muchas gracias, Lía. Te pedimos que te mantengas eh, conectada para que escuches el resto de las intervenciones y obviamente de las preguntas. Y eh, también a, al final de las intervenciones eh, te rogaríamos que nos acompañes para que puedas eh, absolver algunas preguntas que estoy segura algunos colegas van a formular. Vamos a continuar eh, con la, el programa, con la presentación. Y tenemos ahora con nosotros al señor eh, Benjamin Herzberg, quien es eh, jefe del programa eh, eh, del sector privado del Banco Mundial. Por favor. Thank you very much. Um, my apologies, I do not speak Spanish, but I speak French. So if you want, we can do the meeting in French. But I'll, I'll stick to English. I'll stick to English, and I, I want to uh, uh, start by saying that since this is a meeting about the session about the corruption and business, it's time to do business. So I would love to do some business with you and to do some business with my colleagues at the table because, as uh, Elen Dzanski mentioned, we are working on the space with a lot of players and it is time to consolidate or at least to link better the initiatives because 
as we saw with the initiative from the Chamber of Commerce, there is a reuse of uh, a number of indicators. We're all working on from different institutions, and this is great because it leverages what we're doing. But when it comes down to the businesses, uh, the businesses, they have primary goals, right? They want to make money, and they don't want to lose money. Uh, what the business wants to do is uh, reduce uh, costs and, and reduce risk. So um, what, what we really have to do is to try to scale, but uh, massively scale, the adoption of uh, those anti-corruption practices by the businesses. And so there are several ways to do this. And there are several ways to do this kind of development work. And of course, we have the large initiative that try to put the knowledge together. And this is great, we need the knowledge. Uh, we need the big CEOs to take commitments and sign up declarations, whether it's uh, from uh, the Apache uh, declarations or it's from the uh, UN uh, Global Compact, whatever uh, thing they want to, to sign up, this is great. But we, we have at the World Bank the uh, Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative that works on uh, the, the tools and the regulation about tracking corruption, tax evasion, a lot of different things exist. But when it comes to the small business in a remote location, they are very far removed from this. And we always believe that there is some kind of intermediate between the behavior of the business and then there is us, the countries, the international institutions that need to kind of put something out there for the business to pick up. Now, remember a long time ago, if you wanted to do some uh, trading with the money that you have at the bank for your savings, you had to go through a financial analyst. You had to pay someone who was an intermediate, who knew the system and who could actually do it for you. Today you don't need to do that because you can go on e-trade using the internet and have that behavior yourself and start to trade tomorrow morning just with a credit card online. Well, the online revolution is also very, very relevant to the anti-corruption work. And we believe that there is a movement out there which we call open private sector. The same way you have open aid, open data, open government, uh, you, open civil society, you have an open private sector, which are adoption by the private sector of practices which are good because they're going to help sustainability, they're going to help anti-corruption, they're going to help governance, they're going to help social stuff but not for the greater good, because business don't really care about the greater good. They care about their business. So you remember how we had philanthropy at the beginning, and then we moved from that to CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Corporate Social Responsibility is kind of a, I'm a business, I'm doing profit, I am a mining company, for instance, and I know I'm gonna create a number of disruptions where I am, and so because of that, I'm going to try to, be, to, to, have, to take the money I'm doing from my profit and investing, invest that money into social, environmental work. So what I do with CSR is I'm kind of buying a license to operate. But we are now going to the next stage, the stage of creating shared value, where at the core of the business, you have the incentive to adopt certain behavior that uh, help sustainability, reduce corruption, help governance, have a social impact. And this is not just something you do on the side, this is something that you do as part of your business to increase both the bottom line and development impact. So what I'm talking to you about now is not what the development community can do for the private sector. It is about what the private sector can do for development and what an open private sector can do for development. What we're putting together is a, a big platform, and I invite my colleagues to eventually join this platform or, or link to it. It's a platform that is based on uh, technological tools where there is no intermediate between a business and a behavior so that we can accelerate the uptake of behaviors that both are good for the bottom line, and both are good for the uh, governance environment. So we're creating this online platform about 
uh, the, those tools. And what you have in these platforms is a set of questions and a set of answers from the point of view of a company. And what I will do is I will go through the building blocks of this and then I will present online one of those tools. But there are four others behind that I'm not going to talk about. What are those five building blocks? They ask the key questions as a company who wants to improve my bottom line but also my development impact at the same time. How do I make sure I work with clean businesses? Because this is a business imperative for me. What we've done here is we uh, try to open corporate registries around the world because at the root cause, at the root of uh, behavior between companies, you have who you're dealing with, what are the, the, the identity of those companies. And imagine that you could take all the companies of the world in every single corporate registries of the world and agglomerate them in a single global open transparent registry and then you could do really cool database things with that you will have an amazing transnational data set where as a little business wherever I am I could access it type the name of a company and see who really owns that company because in the company I'm looking at they have shareholders, they have directors. And those shareholders and directors, which other companies are they involved with? So if I'm doing with company A, I might realize that actually I'm doing business with company B, C, D, E, F, or maybe Z. And so this is quite revolutionary when you put this tool in front of people because that's a business imperative. When I'm doing a contract with someone, I want to do a contract with someone I can trust because business is based on trust. In order to do this, we need to help open corporate registries all around the world. And that means that they have to be searchable, they have to be accessible, transparent, and free. And so we created something called the Open Company Data Index. And this is what I'm going to show to you in a minute. So hold that thought, because this is a pretty cool application I'm going to show you. But I want to talk to you about the other component of the platform first, briefly. The second question we ask is, as a business, who wants to improve my bottom line and, imp and improve my development impact, how do I reduce the risk in my supply chain on governance, cost and risk, and sustainability cost and risk? The way I traditionally do this, if I'm a big company on top, is I send my inspectors, I create a number of standards and I try to control all my suppliers and I send my inspectors to look in my supply chain and I have checks and balances in there. But it's very costly. So what you have had over time is when you have clusters of companies who operate in the same sector, they try to apply global standards or sector standards for those companies so that if I'm in textile and I'm in Bangladesh, I can ask all the companies to apply to the same standards because one supplier, of course, works with many purchasers and you don't want to burden the suppliers with uh, adopting many many uh, standards even when it comes to corruption standards. So now you have the next stage which is imagine a global transparent repository of kind of ID cards for every single company where they put in a transparent manner their sustainability data and their governance information out there where every company can have a company profile. Today, this, it exists. We work with them and we're developing a product with them. There is 115,000 companies who are already in the system. It's very small compared to the 400 million companies that you have in the world, but it's a start. And what you can do as a, as a, as a purchaser is you can take a needle and you can thread through all the companies that you're working with and then you can agglomerate this information. You can see how much water are they using, you can see how much electricity they are using, but you can also see the minerals that they are using. Are they coming from conflict zones and if so, are they certified by the smelters where those minerals are treated before they arrive to the company? So companies like Intel or AMD are using those kind of open systems today because you want to certify conflict minerals. You want to certify the provenance of the rare woods that you're using. This is very relevant for Latin, Amer Latin America. Um, 
the you want to certify that there is issues about uh, about the labor uh, child labor for instance so we uh, are about to launch and we'll do that at the open governance partnership uh, summit in uh, in london on october 31st the open supply chain global dashboard where you'll be able to see the agglomerated uh, indicators for the use uh, by all the businesses that are on those open platforms uh, of a number of governance indicators. We are also uh, asking the question, as a business, how do I access public contract opportunities and have a fair chance of competing and reduce risk of contract disputes? Because we talk about open contracting and transparency as a means to reduce corruption, but the primary need of the business is not that, it's to say, I want to access public contracts and I want to make sure that nobody else has more chance than me to access that contract, that there is a level playing field. And once we're in the contract, I want to make sure, you know, the government doesn't change the terms. So uh, we are putting an open contracting index. We have already an open contracting program at the World Bank and we have put out open contracting principle that a number of uh, countries have started to sign up. And now imagine an online platform where all governments can upload contracts. It exists already today, for instance, for a very limited of number of contracts on the mining industry. It's called uh, resourcecontracts.org. You have 123 mining contracts completely open. The civil society can access them and make sure that the deal is kosher and that uh, everything is uh, implemented, all the safeguards are in there. The governments can, can look at it and the private sector can make sure that it's out there so that it's completely transparent and the government cannot change the deal. Now, this is happening in the US, for instance. In the US, do you know how many issuer of contracts you have? You have 89,000 issuers of contract in the US. And this goes from the federal government to a tiny agency, to a state, to a municipality, to uh, a zoo in a little city that will issue their contract for anything that's public. All this is public money, but down the chain. This is very complex, but the private sector would like to access those contracts, and the governments want the private sector to access those contracts. And the more it transparents, the more it reduces corruption, which is what we're talking about here. But we're taking the, this from the other flip of the coin, from the benefit of the private sector to be able to access contract. The government wants all the contracts out there because they get more better bidders. So we're building uh, a global applications where governments will be able to upload contracts and businesses will be able to data mine that, that database. We're also talking about corruption, uh, meaning that Sometime, someone gets a contract for a road, but the road doesn't exist. And uh, the bridge, but the bridge is not built. Or um, a water contract, but there is no water at the well. And this is also another softer way of corruption. It's like, oh, you're not doing service delivery. And so beneficiary feedback is very important. And so as a business, how do I connect with my consumer at the very end of the bottom of the pyramid, so I make sure that actually the investment um, is working well. Why do I collect feedback and map my investment? Is there water at the well? Is there a nurse in a hospital? Is there a teacher in a school? There are no really cool applications we can do with cell phones, and everybody has cell phones, simple ones, SMS, where there are a lot of communications between the government and the citizens, but the same thing between the businesses and the citizens, and also between the businesses and the bottom of their supply chain. That's very important because when I'm a big company, let's say like Starbucks, I will have a tendency to consider that my supply chain stops exactly when the formal sector stops and the informal sector starts. But the truth is that a lot of things are happening in the informal sector. And so if on top of the supply chain, I can actually connect to the bottom of the supply chain, if I'm in Bangladesh, I can know that the the condition in which the workers are, are bad before the building collapses on the worker, like it happened uh, a few months ago. So 
uh, we're working on putting a beneficiary feedback app store where companies, wherever they are, big or small, will be able to get in there and use those applications. And an app store doesn't mean just iPhone app store or Android app stores. It means also server components that I can plug in into my uh, CRM system, my customer relationship management system, my uh, supply chain system. I can plug into uh, a mobile phone provider in order to be able to pull uh, an, a number of people at the bottom of the pyramid. Finally, uh, we already have and we are uh, uh, redeveloping a public-private dialogue knowledge hub with public-private dialogue tools because we know that collective action is very important. Business uh, government relationships uh, need to be catered to and as a business I need to collaborate with the government and also with industry peers in order to solve competitiveness issues. That's the imperative for me. But we know historically that when those dialogues happen you have a reduction of corruption because one of the issues is you you then give a level playing field, you transform lobbying into advocacy because you create a space for dialogue where people can talk about skills, labor, uh, uh, about access to finance, infrastructure, business environment, and so on and so forth. Like business forums, and I'm sure there are in some countries here business forums. Um, so the question is, you want to be able to participate. So those business forums is to be quite interactive. And so we have a knowledge hub on public-private dialogue, but we're rebuilding it to put it completely in an interactive way that everybody can participate. These are a suite of tools, and of course it's something we're doing in partnership with a number of people. We have not extended the partnership yet to everybody. It's, it's starting already within the World Bank, which is not a small deal, you know, to make everybody work together, as you know. And then we extend it to external partners. Uh, we're working with the UK, we're working with the Shared Value Initiative of Michael Porter. We're working with a few others uh, to try to bring those ideas together. There will be a lot of knowledge and learning activities around it, and outreach two countries to talk to the top 300 people in each of the countries to say these are the tools that you can use as a business to become an open private sector. So we know that you don't want to deal with bad companies. It's good if you stay neutral, but what if you become a good company in a way that you not only uh, create jobs and create growth, but also have a positive impact on your environment. I don't want to switch to this little demonstration I wanted to make about the first uh, product. There are others, they are online, but I just want to talk about this one today. The Open Corporate Data Index. The Open Company Data Index. It's an index of a number of countries. Today we only took the countries uh, for beta version which are part of the Open Governance Partnership. But uh, in about three months you'll have uh, 183 countries uh, in there. And this is looking at the transparency of the corporate registry. So, um, if we take, um, let's take a country to look at, Colombia, for instance. We have the representative from Colombia here, I guess, right? Somewhere over there. <laughs> so, if I take a country like Colombia, and I click on it, if uh, the thing works, of course, because I don't know if the internet is still connected. Here, here, you go. here we go. I can get the information about the corporate registry. And we're looking first is, can I freely search this registry? And in Colombia, yes, you can. Someone can go in the registry and say, I'm looking for the company uh, Starbucks Inc., you know, and they see if, if there is a Starbucks register in there. But the question is, can you license this data? Because in this new world of open data, it's very important to be able to take that data and reuse it and mesh it with other things. So we're looking if, if the data is licensable and also if you can get it in a way which is machine readable. We're also looking at the depth of data. Once, when you look at the company, do you get information about the directors, about the filings, about the shareholders? So it's very simple. It's a bunch of yes-no questions. For any of those on the Open Company Data Index, you can see, for instance, it's freely searchable. You can compare that with all the other countries which have been measured, and uh, you can see if they are, um, uh, how do they fare compared to the other on that particular indicator. So this is a policy drive to try to help the policymaker make the step to do this. Now, what's interesting, I told you about this imaginary global database of 
company names. Well, it's not really imaginary. It actually exists. Today, there is 60 million records. Remember, the world is about 400 million businesses. So we're not there yet, but it's getting there. Because every time a company registry opens, the information is added to the global database. So I'm going to make a search for a company. It's called Barclays Bank. And uh, click on the search button. And from here, I'm going to get uh, a list of Barclays Bank PLC. And this list is pulled out from all the companies which are right now publicly available. Right? And from that, I'm going to choose one to look at, the one from the United Kingdom. So here we're going to our partners. We're developing those things with partners. This is a partner called Open Corporates. And I'm getting there, and I'm going to see, as it's loading, I think the internet is a bit slow through the Wi-Fi. Here we go. I see the actual sheet of Barclays Bank from the company registry that I selected. And this is already a great thing, right? Because there is one point where I can see all the Barclays Bank of all the different countries. And this one, I get information, the directors, the shareholders, and all this. But what can I do with that? I can make it link with all the other companies that this company I'm looking at is linked to. And so I get to this application where I can see the relationship between Barclays and all the others. But this relationship is sometimes not so <laughs> straightforward as I'm looking on this graph. So, since I like Star Wars, I'm going to make a big star. What I'm going to do here is putting together this company that I was looking at in relationship to any other company that it has a relationship to by looking at comparing all the data across all the corporate registries, 60 million records that are open in the world right now, and we're going to look if there are uh, common shareholders, common directors, relationship of subsidiary, and so on. And this is amazing because this gets to the topic of beneficial ownership, which is crucial to the corruption topic and to business and corruption. And if you've noticed the G8 talks, you've seen that the way that most governments wanted to go at beneficial ownership is by creating regulation, and those regulations will ask businesses to submit information about who are their beneficial owners. But in a way, it's kind of asking a burglar to hand over the burglary map, you know? They're not going to do that if they want to hide something. And anyway, there is too much pressure from the businesses, which meant that at the G8 meeting, this agreement was not done. This is flipping the coin. If we go at the root information, which is the corporate registry information, and we put this information out there, open data, transparent data, and we give a tool, to any small business in the middle of Haiti, in the middle of Bolivia, Brazil, they can access this and they can see who they're going to do business with tomorrow. That's a huge way to reduce corruption. Very practical, very viral. But you can even look at this data and do a lot of different visualization. Uh, I pulled up a few tabs before because this, as you can see, is pretty data intensive and this connection is not very fast. So I want to show you this one. This is another visualization of the same information. This one is about Goldman Sachs. The reason I took financial information is that there is the SEC in the US has a, providing a lot of database information and some corporate registries are more open than others. So this is great. This is putting in a visual way the relationship these are all the companies which Goldman Sachs, Inc., has some kind of a relationship with, and they're controlling relationships. And what those dots are, all the blue dots that you see on the screen, I don't know if you can see the, the colors here, the blue dots are uh, companies, and the red dots are companies in tax havens. And that big blob you see on the bottom of the US, is the Cayman Islands, which is pretty nice as a space, you know? And look at those, those relationships. Every time I click here, I'm on one of those dots. 
I'm looking at a company. And sometimes you see circular relationships. You've got to understand the business, the world we live in is a different world that we lived 10 years ago. Not to create a company, you can create a company for 10 minutes just to do a transaction. You do it online, you create the company, you close the company or you leave it there and you pass to something else. You might have several companies being created just for a deal, just for a day. But that's how corruption travels. That's how tax evasion happens. And so you can see really complete relationships where you're going to have not only things here between the US, but things that go uh, yeah, let me try to find a cool one. I, I don't know this one, so I'm just like, here we go. Oh, that was a nice one. Here we go. Now, if I want to track that, how else am I going to do it that if all the corporate registries are open? And I can go to those dots here, and I can click on those dots, and you can see on the bottom, uh, on the top of the screen, you will see uh, Triumph 3 Investments Limited. This one, which is uh, in Luxembourg, uh, you know, GSMPV Onshore SRL. Well, how the hell am I going to know that it belongs to the mezzanine partner of offshore funds who belongs to the mezzanine, who belongs to this, who belongs to, that, who belongs to Goldman Sachs? So here, of course, I got a lot of data, right? And you have a smaller amount of data. But if you're in the middle of a country which has a lot of corruption and people uh, and even you, your, your countries, you're representing countries, you have public partnership units, PPP units. You're doing bids all the time. You got to do your due diligence. Now, you could do this kind of due diligence before, but you had to pay for it. You had to go to Dow Jones, give them a lot of money. You got to go to private services. But now, you can do it online, you can do it for free. What we do with the open private sector platform, we're trying to massively scale the uptake of governance and sustainable behavior by the private sector in a way that gives them as valuable services for their bottom line. So I chose to talk about this today and not about the institutional things we're doing about anti-corruption and we're doing a lot of those institutional things about anti-corruption. This is really cool. This is really new. It's viral. Some of the other tools I didn't show you are completely viral. And it's working. I invite you to join. This is great. It's going to change the world. We want in three years to have about three million businesses using those kind of open private sector business, uh, practices. If you're interested, we talk afterwards. But this is great. This is development in action using the tools of today. Thank you. Muchas gracias a Benjamín. Ahora sí, les agradecemos a todos los, los invitados por sus disertaciones, a Lía, a, a Elaine y a Patrick. Y eh, damos paso a las preguntas. Eh, por favor, aquellos que quieran hacer, hacer alguna, alguna pregunta a nuestros invitados. República Dominicana. Hacemos primero una ronda de preguntas y luego pasamos a las respuestas de los invitados. República Dominicana. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Eh, primero que todo, agradecer y felicitar a los, a los exponentes de las diferentes instituciones. Fueron muy, uh, muy edificantes sus ponencias, pero aprovechando el tiempo y para que podamos participar todos, sola, voy a hacer una sola pregunta enfocada a Lía, de la OSA de Lía. ¿Está con nosotros? O, ¿Tiene que ser en inglés o hay traducción para esto? Hay traducción. Hay traducción, perfecto. Lía, la pregunta mía va enfocada. Sí, sí escuchas. Yes, I can hear. Ok, uh, I'll say it in English for your better understanding. ¿Es it ok? Sí, eso es bien. Ok, good. My, my question is regarding uh, if you have any recommendation for public officials in the, uh, better say, prosecutors in judicial officials for building and investigating bribery cases. Say we have the legislation, but if you can give me a few recommendations or key guidelines to look when investigating a bribery case, to make an effective bribery case, that will be very helpful for us. Thank you. Vamos a continuar con las preguntas. El Colombia. Buenas tardes, señora presidenta. Uh, if I can answer that question straight away, 
Um, th thank you very much to the delegate from the Dominican Republic for this question, which is one of the key challenges for all countries that have put in place effective uh, anti-bribery legislation that have made it a crime to bribe officials domestically and abroad is how to put in place this legislation, how to, how to enforce this legislation. Uh, and, and we see that that is the key challenge among uh, states' parties to the anti-bribery convention. Uh, one of the measures that the Working Group on Bribery has taken to address this challenge is to convene twice a year confidential meetings of law enforcement officials that are involved in the investigation and prosecution of foreign bribery cases. Now, these meetings are held uh, the day before the opening of the plenary meeting of the Working Group on Bribery, uh, which are held four times a year here in Paris. Uh, such is the confidential nature of these meetings that I, as a member of the Secretariat, am not able to participate. But these meetings are invaluable because they bring prosecutors together face to face to discuss cases that often involve one or more of uh, their countries or their jurisdictions that they may well be involved in. And that can assist them in getting the relevant evidence uh, or in, in filling out the requirements for mutual legal assistance requests uh, with their colleagues in other countries. I think that one of the key, um, one of the most important uh, things for a prosecutor to get in place when trying to investigate or prosecute these cases is a network of contacts uh, of prosecutors in other countries that are facing the same challenges so that there can be a sharing of knowledge and experience. In terms of specific recommendations, uh, you'll see in, in the current phase of reviews, phase three, uh, there is a, a strong focus on enforcement uh, of, the, and of the foreign bribery offences. And these reports contain country-specific recommendations. Uh, so that might be of interest for the Dominican Republic to refer to, to see if there are any countries that are facing similar challenges to prosecutors um, in your country and to see what kind of recommendations have been formulated to them. But I can tell you already that a common theme in the recommendations provided to countries is uh, the adequacy of resources and training provided to prosecutors. Because often prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases are not necessarily experienced. These are very new offences in the penal codes. And so they need to have the relevant training and the relevant uh, resources to be able to, to carry out their role. I hope that's, um, that has been helpful. Uh, and please do consult the OECD website to see uh, the, the phase three reports and the recommendations that are annexed to them in case there might be a further help. Muchas gracias, Lía. Eh, Colombia, por favor, ahora sí, por favor. Gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Para que las empresas cumplan los estándares éticos que nos están exponiendo esta tarde, acuden a varios índices del Banco Mundial, uno de ellos el Doing Business. Hemos visto este formidable índice abierto de los datos corporativos, que realmente serviría de ejemplo para el índice Doing Business del propio Banco Mundial. Como nos tomaron de ejemplo esta tarde a Colombia, que agradecemos porque nos permite ilustrar y redondear el ejemplo con lo que ocurrió el año pasado con el índice Doing Business, guía importante de los sectores privado y público, desde luego también para trabajar contra la corrupción. Hicieron una medición de campo a través de este índice para medir tiempos procesales en justicia, lo que nos preocupa a los países aquí presentes. Y dio dos resultados diametralmente opuestos, ambos concebidos en sus resultados por el Banco Mundial. En el primero, arrojó 1.300 días contados a partir del primer día del expediente judicial hasta el último día del mismo. Y este de 1.300 se obtuvo a través de una metodología telefónica. Seleccionaron lo que para el Banco Mundial eran las 10 oficinas más importantes de abogados. Les hacen a cada uno una llamada. Cuéntenos usted que es importantísimo en el Foro del Derecho en Colombia. ¿Cuánto tiempo se demora un expediente suyo? Y de eso sumó, resto sacó un promedio, le dio 1.300 telefónicos. 
cuando hubo la protesta seria de Colombia diciendo eso no es cierto, el Banco Mundial lo repite ya no con el teléfono, sino va al expediente. Y mira cuánto dura ese expediente desde el primer día hasta el último y le arrojó el resultado real, 700. La equivocación había doblado el resultado, pero ya el daño al país estaba hecho porque los estándares éticos de las empresas se habían guiado por el de 1300 y decisiones de la banca multilateral también. Me parece que es una buena ocasión esta en la que estamos todos compartiendo buenas prácticas para sacar de nuestro mecanismo de seguimiento otra conclusión desde la OEA que puede ser muy capaz de alimentar en Washington, retroalimentar al Banco Mundial y diciendo en una presentación del Banco Mundial se tomó como buen ejemplo a Colombia, el ejemplo se terminó de ilustrar con lo que dieron los dos resultados del mismo indicador Doing Business adelantados entre sí con muy poca diferencia de tiempo, para no creer que el tiempo fue el que distanció el 700 de 1300 porque fue de un momento para otro. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Eh, muchas gracias, Colombia. El Salvador. Um, my question is for, for Lea, and uh, I'll formulate it in, in English as well. Um, I think it's, 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 it's easier that way. Um, Uh, the first of all, first of all, a, a general observation is, is is the fact that the scheme and the design uh, that you have, which which looks perfectly workable, um, seems perfectly workable in developed countries, not so much in developing countries. And uh, with regards to that, I, I have an observation um, on two levels, um, based on the law of unintended consequences. Um, whereby that, that sort of, of, uh, of scheme uh, lends itself or might lend itself in an underdeveloped country. Uh, well, they call them developing countries now, non, no longer underdeveloped countries. Um, on a personal level, uh, in terms of whistleblowers, to uh, either extortion and impunity, and on a social level, to... Um, to the fact that, that the, these kinds of mechanisms uh, might be uh, politicized. D do, you have, um, do you have any thoughts on this? Thank you. Lia, si nos permites. Thank you very much for your question, El Salvador. And I, I would start off by saying I don't think it's, uh, it's a question that's restricted uh, to Uh, developing or least developed countries. I think it's, it's whistleblower protection mechanisms are at a very early stage around the world. Even when there is adequate legislation in place in a country to protect whistleblowers in the private and public sector, and even when uh, some of the, the largest uh, multinational companies that are headquartered in these countries that have such legislation have put in place internal mechanisms We're still seeing that in the field of corruption, there are very few reports of corruption that are coming up or are being raised by whistleblowers. And I've spoken with a number of different companies uh, from France, or from the US, from the UK, from Germany, that have all said that they have state-of-the-art whistleblower protection mechanisms to encourage employees to come forward and to disclose cases of bribery and I have never heard a company tell me that they have had one single report. So I think that the, the issue of, um, of the social perception of whistleblowers and of, of uh, whether or not you will actually be preferred, afforded the protection that you're guaranteed is one that is, is faced by, by companies and by governments alike. Uh, I think that there, there needs to be very much a shift in mentality across the board, regardless of the stage of development of a particular eco economy. But I agree in some respects, uh, and this is what I see in, in, in countries that don't yet have in place whistleblower protection mechanisms, is that there is a much more focus on protection in the sense of life and limb. And that a lot of countries are still thinking about witness protection and about the need to protect individuals who will provide evidence in criminal proceedings 
from threats to their livelihoods, their lives or their families, rather than going so going to into the realm of whistleblower protection, which is is not as so to speak, as, as serious as such, because there you're protecting individuals from reprisals, from discrimination, um, from disciplinary acts that are based purely on the fact that they're bringing uh, reports to the attention of competent authorities of the company. So I think that that's an important distinction that needs to be made when we're thinking about whistleblower protection in particular. And I think often countries that don't have strong witness protection uh, legislation might think of doing think of that as a, a more important uh, priority than whistleblower protection. So I, I, ho I hope that answers your question. And all these issues are discussed, as I said, in the G20 study on whistleblower protection, which is available online. Thanks very much. Muchas gracias, Lia. Antigua y Barbuda. Good afternoon. My question is for Mr. Hertzberg. I hope I correctly said that, yes. Um, regarding the um, open sector, oh, sorry, open private sector, the program that you were just showing us, um, it's a very interesting program. I just wanted to find out, do you need to be a member um, to actually access it? Because I am actually work with an organization that deals with money laundering and drug offenses, and we normally have to research companies. And I think it's a great tool, not just for um, investigating a company to do business with, but when it comes to that kind of investigation where you're looking to find out who are the beneficial owners of the company, um, it's a great tool, and who the company has been connected with. So I just wanted to know, do you need to be an or can you just go online and type in? Thank you. Benjamin, esperamos el que terminen las preguntas. Estados Unidos, por favor. Thank you, Chair. I actually don't have a question, but wanted to mention that the U.S.'s Department of Justice representative delegate to the Working Group on Bribery is here and would also be happy to discuss with any members who are interested. Uh, we also offered, I think, a the last Mississic meeting, that if anyone would be interested in discussing asset recovery related matters, our Department of Justice colleagues have also made themselves available. Let me also say thank you to all the presenters for their informative presentations and to the Secretariat for organizing this session. Thank you. Gracias, Estados Unidos. Ahora sí pasamos, por favor, Benjamin. To respond to the question? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. No, you do not need to register. The idea is that it's all free. There is no registration and all this. The problem is that it's, you have today, uh, not all registries are available online. But anything that's today in the world available online is accessible through that database. 60 million records. Uh, India, for instance, has 1.2 million records. So it depends on the country. I don't have in my head all the countries. Uh, but uh, some of you here are in that database. And some of you are not. But I think one of the messages you should bring back home is let's be in rather than out because uh, the public registrars, they are not a business. So I know that some, some of them think like, well, we need to actually finance the revenues for the public registrars by making sure people you know, give a fee when they want to search for businesses. But that's not their primary reason for being there. So they should be open. And I even invite you to go to the, uh, if some of you are part of the Open Government Partnership, when the Open Government Partnership happens in London at October 31st, to go in with one of your achievements, Open Government Partnership achievements, to say, we put the registry online. Because it's, it's really looking at the governance from, from the demand side, not on the supply side. And the business need that. And if the business need transparent businesses, it will reduce the number of but you don't need to go, you don't need to be registered. So is it, um, is it correct for me to say that the businesses registered on that website are, are considered to be above board businesses? No, no? because the, what, the, what you saw on these websites is only the mirror image of what is on the corporate registry of that country. So 
when you want to do business in your country, you have to register in the registrar office. This information is somewhere in a locked door, and one day it goes online. If it goes online, then there is a, what we call an API, some kind of a link between two databases that makes it that people can use that data, play with it, and display it somewhere else. And actually, the entire aggregated data of the database of open co corporates is a shared use license as well, which means that application developers can go in there and develop more visualization and all this. But it doesn't mean that the business that you see is above uh, others or is a good, you know, well-behaved. No, it's just a record. That's what it is, a record, and the quality of that record depends on the quality of the record that was taken when the company registered at the first place. Muchas gracias. El Salvador quiere hacer una pregunta. Eh, sí, una, uni, eh, una única pregunta nada más. Eh, eh, bueno, además de acompañar a Estados Unidos en el agradecimiento a los eh, distinguidos invitados por, por, por la presentación interesantísima que tuvimos esta tarde, eh, el tiempo que se tomaron. Eh, eh, para acercarse a nosotros. Eh, y, y la pregunta quizás va con la Secretaría Técnica, eh, con la Secretaría Jurídica, perdón, de, de, de aquí de OEA y, y, y el mecanismo en sí. Y es, eh, 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 al doctor García, quizás, eh, eh, si, si, si visualizan eh, eh, algún tipo de, de, de utilidad, eh, digamos, complementaria, de, de estas herramientas fantásticas que nos han mostrado esta tarde eh, 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 en, la, eh, en el trabajo del MESICIC y, 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 y en un mejor, eh, digamos, monitoreo de, 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 del cumplimiento de los países eh, a, a, con los preceptos de la convención. Nada más. Gracias, Presidenta. Sí, muy brevemente, como lo mencionamos al comienzo de la, de la reunión, esta sesión con organismos internacionales y la, y la que continúa en que participarán diversos representantes de Estados, hace parte de lo que llamamos la segunda fase de la metodología que este comité adoptó para la consideración de este tema de interés colectivo, que tiene que ver con todo lo relacionado con la responsabilidad del sector privado en la prevención y, y el combate a la corrupción. Eh, la metodología que adoptó el comité prevé cuatro fases. Una primera fase que era un estudio que elaboraba la Secretaría y que está en nuestra página en Internet, en la cual se hacía básicamente era un inventario de todos aquellos desarrollos que había en la materia, tanto en el marco de organismos internacionales, organizaciones de la sociedad civil, organizaciones del sector privado y, por supuesto, de los estados miembros de nuestra organización que han proveído esa información. Todo ese inventario está allí eh, sistematizado. Una segunda fase es esta, que es un intercambio de información sobre desarrollos entre los estados, desarrollos que se han hecho en organismos internacionales, desarrollos de organizaciones de la sociedad civil y del sector privado. Y una tercera fase va a ser la elaboración de unas propuestas de recomendaciones concretas, que como decía, no son recomendaciones ya específicas a un estado en particular, sino recomendaciones de carácter colectivo, de cómo podemos avanzar colectivamente en la región, en los temas de eh, responsabilidad del sector privado, sobre todo el papel que le corresponde al Estado en asegurar la responsabilidad del sector privado en la prevención y el combate a la corrupción. En la Secretaría, en la metodología prevé que la Secretaría va a elaborar una propuesta de, de recomendaciones y que esas recomendaciones van a ser consideradas aquí, discutidas aquí y acordadas por el Comité, y una vez el Comité las, las acuerde, pues van a ser elevadas a la conferencia de los Estados parte y esperamos que eh, la propia metodología prevé que de alguna manera se eh, prevea algún seguimiento a los desarrollos que se van haciendo en relación con esas, esas recomendaciones. Luego, es, ese sería el aprovechamiento que se hace toda esta información. Nosotros estamos recogiendo toda esta información, las presentaciones, lo, la, las diferentes eh, información que se ha compartido con, con el comité, tanto en esta sesión como en sesiones previas y, y quizás en, en sesiones posteriores, y luego todo eso va a buscarse sistematizar de alguna medida en la propuesta de, de recomendaciones que se van a elaborar. Eh, muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. 
Muchas gracias, eh, Jorge. Eh, el señor Patri, que quiere hacer una, una pequeña puntualización respecto de los comentarios que algunos de ustedes han formulado. Patri. Muchas gracias, Susana, y gracias a, a todos por su tiempo. Um, I, I would just comment on the uh, suggestion from the representative from Colombia regarding metrics to say that, you know, from the private, private sector perspective, we certainly uh, recognize that none of the measurements that are out there are perfect, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons that we're trying to look at the broadest possible base so that, uh, you know, there can be some greater credibility by referencing multiple sources by having third-party validation and certainly we uh, encourage our members to take into account a broad range of uh, measurements, uh, indices, analyses and making their investment decisions and I'm confident that, that they do that. And uh, But we, we do need to rely somewhat on those metrics in order to, to make improvements and so we want to work with uh, Columbia and other interested parties to help refine uh, those metrics and make them better um, and look forward to uh, engaging with any of you who are interested in that undertaking. So with that, thank you, Susanna. Por favor. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll just add, I'm not from the unit uh, calculating the doing business, but uh, uh, so I don't want to speak uh, fully on their behalf, but you know, there might be issues with the doing business on one rating or this other rating. Uh, in uh, the entire doing business has a number of indicators. Each indicator is made of sub-indicators. I think there is an effort to do the best job possible. And sometimes, uh, if there are mistakes, there are recourse mechanisms for countries to say something and eventually it's exchanged. So we learn from the, those mistakes. But as a whole, the indicator, I think, has done a lot for uh, reducing red tape. And we know that red tape is directly correlated to corruption. Because the more point of contact you have for any given state transaction between uh, a customer and a citizen and the end of that transaction, that as many occasions for someone to ask for uh, facilitation of that step. And the more things are fully transparent or simplified or even the best, online, then it reduces that opportunity. And we also know that the complexity of rules and regulation by itself is a source of confusion for businesses and which uh, puts people in a position to help them out, to reduce that confusion. And so uh, I think it's still a very important agenda. The index is uh, worked on every year to make it as best as possible. When there are mistakes, they are corrected. And uh, overall, it gives a general appreciation of the red tape that companies face in a country, although I do not know the particular case of this indicator, but I'm happy that it was eventually corrected. Muchas gracias. Con estas intervenciones eh, damos por, por concluida la, la, la parte en la cual teníamos a estos invitados tan especiales. De nuestra parte agradecerles muchísimo. Ha sido muy importante conocer eh, sus puntos de vista, lo que están haciendo, conocer estas estas iniciativas que están teniendo, particularmente la del Banco Mundial, que ha sido muy interesante para todos. Y les agradecemos mucho eh, y los invitamos a quedarse en la siguiente parte, que es en la que vamos a tener unas muy breves pre eh, presentaciones de parte de Brasil, México y Perú sobre los avances que se están teniendo en materia nuevamente de lo que es la lucha contra la corrupción desde el sector privado en colaboración con el sector público. Sé que algunos de ustedes tienen un problema de tiempo, como Elaine, pero igual los invitamos eh, a, que, a que puedan compartir con nosotros. Por favor, les damos un aplauso eh, en agradecimiento. Gracias. Gracias. Invitamos, por favor, a Brasil.
Boa tarde a todos. É, gostaria primeiramente de agradecer a, a Secretaria pelo espaço, que é muito importante para todos nós, para que exponhamos no, no, nos nossos avanços, é, tenhamos um espaço para discutir a, as nossas dificuldades. É um espaço super importante. Queria primeiramente agradecer bastante a Secretaria Executiva por, por, por esse espaço. É, eu gostaria de compartilhar com os colegas peritos, com, com os representantes de organismos internacionais aqui presentes, uh, um importante avanço conquistado pelo Brasil no ano de 2013, que foi a aprovação da Lei de Responsabilização de Pessoas Jurídicas por Atos Lesivos contra a Administração Pública Nacional e Estrangeira. E por que, por que um avanço? E por que o Brasil precisava de uma, de uma, lei, de uma lei dessa natureza? Ah, o, existiam limitações, ou, ou, ou a legislação brasileira, até então, era incompleta no que tange a responsabilização de empresas por atos cometidos pela administração pública, contra a administração pública nacional e estrangeira. A, a nossa legislação, em verdade era muito focada na responsabilização das pessoas físicas que praticavam atos. Né? Nós temos a, a, a previsão na nossa legislação de responsabilização de pessoas a, físicas que, que, que subornam um funcionário público estrangeiro. Nós temos toda uma legislação voltada para é, responsabilização de servidores públicos que cometem atos é, é, irregulares, mas a nossa, a nossa, a, a, as nossas previsões quanto à responsabilização de pessoas jurídicas eram muito escassas. Uh, nós não, não tínhamos, por exemplo, uh, qualquer legislação que abarcasse as nossas empresas enquanto atuavam no exterior. Uh, as, as multas, por exemplo, que podiam ser aplicadas a, a empresas brasileiras com relação a irregularidades em contratos, elas iam no máximo até o valor do contrato. Então, é, essa lei é uma lei de suma importância uh, 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 para o país. Além disso, é, respalda um compromisso assumido nos foros internacionais, um compromisso assumido na própria Convenção da OEA, contra a corrupção, na Convenção da ONU, Convenção da OCDE. O Brasil, inclusive, havia recebido, na, no marco da, da, da terceira rodada aqui do Mississippi, uma, uma recomendação para adotar medidas pertinentes para aplicar sanções às empresas domiciliadas no território que, que, que praticassem a conduta descrita no artigo 8º da Convenção, que os senhores bem sabem o artigo que fala do, do suborno transnacional. Então, é, por isso é um avanço e por isso o Brasil precisava tanto de uma lei dessa natureza. Entrando especificamente nos aspectos da lei, talvez o, 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 o principal ponto, o coração da lei, na nossa concepção, é a, a previsão da responsabilidade objetiva, da responsabilidade direta, uh, das empresas. É, não que as pessoas físicas não serão responsabilizadas, não é esse o ponto. O ponto é que basta que o, 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 o ato lesivo seja identificado e que se... Basta a identificação do ato lesivo e identificação que aquele ato foi cometido em benefício da empresa para que exista a punição. Não é necessário, por exemplo, se, 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 se configurar elementos subjetivos como dolo, culpa. Não é necessário, principalmente, que a pessoa física seja condenada antes para que só então se responsabilize a pessoa uh, jurídica. Esse aspecto é muito importante, é um aspecto, inclusive, bastante é, é, debatido e colocado na própria convenção da, da, da OCDE, é, que a Lia bem explicou alguns aspectos fundamentais hoje. Uma outra questão importante que eu gostaria de compartilhar com, com todos os colegas é a opção no Brasil pela responsabilização administrativa e civil da pessoa jurídica. É, é um aspecto 
bem sei que, que é tratado de forma diferente em, em outros países, que inclusive estão aqui na, na mesa. E por que essa opção? E por que não, não, não estamos falando aqui de uma responsabilidade criminal uh, da pessoa jurídica? Um primeiro ponto... É... Um primeiro ponto importante é que há uma discussão muito grande, é, discussão jurídica muito grande no Brasil, sobre a possibilidade da responsabilização criminal de empresas, especialmente considerando a, a responsabilidade de, é, objetiva criminal de empresas. É algo bastante discutível é, no nosso país. Há uma previsão somente na Constituição, é, no caso de crimes ambientais, mas é algo que realmente traria muita dificuldade para a discussão do, projeto, do nosso projeto de lei no Congresso uh, e certamente é, 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 não teríamos uma aprovação tão célere. Haveriam questionamentos do ponto de vista da inconstitucionalidade do projeto. Então, optamos pelo caminho que era uh, possível. E, e é importante dizer que, é, do ponto de vista do nosso direito, é, não há nenhum prejuízo quanto às sanções que vão desde, no âmbito administrativo e civil, que vão desde a uh, aplicação de multas até mesmo a dissolução da própria empresa. Então, que outra penalidade o, o processo criminal poderia trazer mais drástica que a própria dissolução da empresa? Não há que se falar aqui, logicamente, em prisão de empresas. Né? É... Hum... Esses seriam, essas seriam as principais razões pela opção uh, uh, no Brasil pela responsabilidade administrativa e civil e não pela, pela responsabilidade criminal. São atos, então, lesivos contra o governo nacional e estrangeiro. Isso é muito importante, novamente, gostaria de ressaltar, uh, com relação aos compromissos que o Brasil assumiu nas convenções, porque não existia uma legislação que abarcasse as empresas brasileiras que atuavam no exterior e, e, e há toda uma discussão uh, uh, que isso distorcia mercados, uh, afetava até questão de investimento no nosso mercado. Então, isso foi, gostaria de ressaltar novamente, um grande avanço para o nosso país. Uh, atos lesivos, sejam promessas, oferecimentos, concessões de qualquer vantagem devida a funcionário público, aqui nós estamos falando de, de, do suborno, tá? É, funcionário público, para todos os fins, é considerado também o, o, o funcionário de organismos internacionais. É, é, a nossa lei equipara essas duas figuras. E também fraudes, regularidades a respeito de licitações, é, atividades que, que obstaculizem operações, é, é, investigações por, por parte de entidades públicas, funcionários públicos, enfim, é um, é um rol abrangente de atos lesivos que a lei discrimina que se, que se é, 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 arrolados ou que se identificados e sejam responsabilização. Com relação às sanções, uh, do ponto de vista administrativo, as sanções vão desde... Uh, uh, a principal sanção do ponto de vista administrativo é a aplicação de multa, que vai desde 0,1% a 20% do, do faturamento bruto das empresas no ano, no ano anterior, ou, se não for possível calcular o faturamento bruto, 6 mil a 60 milhões de reais. Para que você tenha ideia, você tenha ideia 60 milhões de reais são algo como 25 uh, milhões de dólares. No, na, na, no âmbito civil, as penalidades vão desde confisca confiscação de bens, suspensão das atividades da empresa e, em casos excepcionais, como eu disse, a própria dissolução da empresa, o que, que é a, o, 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 a penalidade mais grave que pode ser aplicada nesse contexto. Uh, com relação à aplicação da multa, é... É, 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 a nossa lei traz diversos fatores que, que, aplique, que, que, que determinam o montante é, da multa a ser aplicada. Fatores que vão uh, uh, desde questões relacionadas à própria infração que foi cometida, à gravidade, à vantagem que foi obtida, uh, 
o dano causado aos cofres públicos, o efeito negativo da infração, mas também alguns fatores relacionados à própria natureza da empresa, à condição econômica uh, do infrator. Né? Não há que se pensar que uma multa, é, para que seja dissuasiva, para que evite que fatos ocorram novamente, pode ser aplicado da mesma forma a uma pequena empresa e uma grande empresa. Né? E no Brasil, nós temos um contexto, é, inclusive considerando o que foi colocado pela colega da OCDE, que é importante que lembrarmos das pequenas empresas e quando, quando falamos, no, quando estamos em países latino-americanos como, como os nossos, é, é, é importante considerarmos que, que há pequenas empresas e no Brasil as empresas, pequenas empresas tem contratos com o governo. Elas se relacionam com o governo. Então, é importante que isso seja considerado. Além disso, uma questão que foi colocada por todos os colegas aqui presentes de organismos internacionais é a questão da existência de mecanismos, procedimentos de integridade nas empresas, mecanismos de compliance. A nossa lei traz que esse é um fator que vai ser considerado para efeitos de aplicação de pena. Então, uma empresa que, por exemplo, possui canais de denúncia, que possui um procedimento interno para, 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 para identificar atos, irregularidades, para remediar de forma rápida irregularidades, que tem regras claras de, de relacionamento com o setor público, é, são questões que serão levadas em consideração quanto da aplicação de penalidades. Né? E o objetivo aqui, lógico, é o, o governo também fomentando mudanças, fomentando a própria lógica de funcionamento do, do, do setor privado. Uma outra questão, que também é considerada para fim de aplicação da multa, é a cooperação com as empresas. Né? É, é, nós sabemos, pela, pela, pela prática dos países que já têm legislação, que esse é um fator importante de sucesso. É, o poder público dificilmente consegue uh, entrar em detalhes uh, se não conta com a cooperação das empresas que estão envolvidas. E nós estamos falando aqui em um ambiente em que atos de corrupção não são admitidos. Então, uh, se há um desvio, é algo que não faz parte da política da empresa, é algo que foi identificado pela empresa, algo que ela quer sanar. Então, por isso, ela coopera com o governo para a questão de produção de provas, uh, para, para entregar informações de investigações internas. E, 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 lógico, para isso é preciso se criar um procedimento. Nós temos a possibilidade da celebração de um acordo de cooperação. E, 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 e lógico, um acordo ele tem que ser benéfico para as duas partes. A possibilidade, inclusive, de redução de penalidade, dependendo do nível de cooperação uh, 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 que a empresa tem com, com o processo investigativo. E, 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 logicamente, também é requisito que a empresa uh, uh, admita sua participação uh, 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 no ilícito e col colabore plenamente com todo o processo administrativo de responsabilização. Uh, processo administrativo esse, é uh, importante ressaltar que a lei brasileira é uma lei nacional. E, e os senhores sabem, o Brasil é muito grande... E, e nós temos diversos estados, mais ainda diversos municípios, e essa lei se aplica tanto no, no, no nível federal como estadual e municipal. E esse processo administrativo de responsabilização ele, ele, ele é conduzido de maneira descentralizada é, pela autoridade máxima de cada organismo afetado uh, 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 pelo ato lesivo previsto na lei. No caso uh, do Poder Executivo Federal, a, a Controladoria Geral da União, a CGU, tem um papel importante porque ela tem competência exclusiva para julgar, entre aspas, aqui, o, os atos cometidos contra o governo estrangeiro e uma, uma, uma jurisdição concorrente uh, uh, no Poder Executivo Federal Brasileiro para avocar e corrigir processos de outros órgãos que, que se identifiquem que não estão, estão sendo conduzidos da forma correta. É, sei que meu tempo é curto, tentei ser o mais breve possível, inclusive para que outros, outros delegados de Peru e, e México pudessem fazer suas, suas explanações. Eu gostaria apenas de, 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 de ressaltar que é, 
aprovar uma lei muitas vezes é mais fácil que implementá-la. E nós temos essa experiência no Brasil é, de aprovação de leis, mas de, uma, de, uma, de um empenho muito grande em, em implementá-las da forma mais correta possível. E, e nós tivemos uma experiência bem recente com a implementação da Lei de Acesso à Informação Pública. É, não é fácil implementar leis. É, a nossa lei foi aprovada em, em julho, terá, entrará em vigor é, no início de 2014, em janeiro de 2014, e, e até lá é, o Brasil está bastante empenhado em, em capacitar seus funcionários, em, em, em aprimorar seus processos, é, reformular processos administrativos para que eles sejam bem, bem executados no início do ano que vem, enfim... É, queria compartilhar apenas com, com os colegas peritos que nós estamos agora num momento de muito empenho para que a lei, quando entre em vigor em janeiro do ano que vem, entre em vigor para valer, não seja um, mais uma lei é, é, apenas no papel. É, fico à disposição para perguntas. Agradeço bastante a atenção dos peritos, a oportunidade novamente da Secretaria Técnica, a participação dos nossos, nossos colegas do, é, dos organismos internacionais que é, eu aproveito a oportunidade apresentaram questões muito relevantes aqui, uh, oportunidades interessantes para trocas de informação e, 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 e boas práticas que, que podem muito bem ser levadas a cabo pelos nossos países. Muito obrigado. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, Brasil. Si hubiera alguna pregunta, alguna intervención, algún pedido de aclaración, Honduras, por favor. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Solo una duda. Eh, según entendí, solo hay responsabilidades civiles y administrativas. Eh, así, así entendí, ¿no? Sin embargo, cuando se habló de la, para la aplicación de las sanciones, eh, uno de los factores era la consumación del delito o no. Entonces entiendo de que también pueden haber acciones penales por la fiscalía u, u otra autoridad, ¿no? Entiendo así. Gracias. Isso talvez tenha sido é, uma imprecisão até do, do um termo impróprio colocado aqui no slide, é, a consumação do, 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 do ato lesivo. Não há que se falar aqui em delito, não é responsabilidade criminal. É, talvez foi um termo atécnico colocado no slide, não sei nem se é um termo da própria lei e se for é um termo uh, que não está bem empregado. Uh, a questão aqui é a consumação do ato lesivo. Nós não estamos falando em responsabilização criminal, é administrativa e civil. Peço perdão pelo, pelo, pela confusão. Nicaragua, por favor. Obrigado, Presidenta. Sim, sí, eh, conforme o exposto por a delegação de Brasil, eh, me queda claro que se trata de uma responsabilidade civil. Eh, sin embargo, creo que já algumas de nossas legislações han venido superando esto, estableciendo lo que se conoce como la figura actuar en nombre de otro, referida a los directivos de las personas jurídicas, que puede ser el apoderado legal, el gerente, X representante legal de la persona, de la persona, de la persona jurídica, que actúa y, que, y a la cual se le atribuye la imposición del, del delito en este caso. Porque perfectamente... Eh, Una persona jurídica puede involucrarse en un peculado, en un enriquecimiento ilícito, puede involucrarse en un delito contra la administración pública. Si bien es cierto, eh, no le impones una, una, una pena eh, desde el punto de vista criminal a una persona jurídica porque no la mandas a la cárcel. En el caso nuestro, eh, sí se enjuicia, sí se juzga al directivo de la persona jurídica y en todo caso las responsabilidades o las penas accesorias como la disolución de la, de la persona jurídica o de la empresa las multas y todo lo que corresponda, son penas accesorias, pero también puedes mandar a la cárcel al directivo de esa persona jurídica. No sé si Brasil ha contemplado eso o solamente se limita a, la, a, la, a imputar una responsabilidad civil en esa persona jurídica. Gracias. Brasil. Uh, conforme eh, ya había colocado anteriormente, la responsabilización de la persona jurídica no excluye 
de forma alguma a responsabilização da pessoa física envolvida. E eu havia mencionado que o Brasil já dispõe de uma legislação farta e, 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 e bastante elaborada com, rela com relação à penalização de pessoas físicas. Isso já existe no Brasil, já existia no Brasil, e, e era possível, sim, penalizar dirigentes de empresas, é, é, sócios de empresas por atos, que, 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 por atos lesivos praticados. O que não era possível era essa responsabilização direta da pessoa jurídica que responde principalmente com seu patrimônio. E isso foi um avanço muito importante na nossa legislação. Mas, de forma alguma, a legislação brasileira exclui a responsabilização da pessoa física. É, sim, possível. E há uma série de normas, uma série de leis, inclusive delitos que, 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 que tipificam esse tipo de conduta no Brasil. Obrigado. Obrigado, Brasil. Uruguai? Quiero felicitar a, a Renato por la espléndida eh, exposición que nos hizo y que este, hayan adoptado en Brasil la parte de, de responsabilidades civiles y no penales para las personas jurídicas, cosa que es una de las aberraciones a las cuales estamos tratando de, de, de oponernos cuando se nos presentan en algunas de las convenciones, en algunos de los tratados que han firmado nuestros países. Pero eh, me preocupa, sí, que sea eh, eh, objetiva la sanción, porque me parece que no está, eh, me parece, eh, tengo anotada la ley para ver si la podemos conseguir en, desde Uruguay, me parece que si la sanción es objetiva, no debería medir factores para nivelar la sanción, ¿verdad? Porque si tú estás tomando en cuenta la forma de actuar de la empresa, es decir, la voluntad de, de los empresarios o de los directores para disminuir o aumentar la pena, tú ya estás buscando un elemento subjetivo en la sanción. Si estás buscando un elemento subjetivo, entonces la sanción no podría ser este, objetiva. Si es objetiva, es objetiva, punto. Y tampoco habría un procedimiento administrativo para determinar, o sea, lo sumo para determinar la sanción, porque el, el delito, eh, la, la infracción, perdón, hablamos de administrativo, la infracción se comete en el momento en que lo determine la ley, cuando el, el hecho previsto en la ley como como infracción administrativa es cometido por la empresa, en ese caso la empresa ya, ya, ya quedó responsable. Entonces, la aplicación de las sanciones. Y a mí me gustan mucho más las sanciones que fijan en cuanto a la imposibilidad de contratar con la, la, el Estado, salir fuera de las listas de, de los proveedores del Estado, el, o, o incluso cerrarla, porque las multas, por más que sean 25 millones de dólares, a lo mejor el negocio que está haciendo es por 500 millones, y les conviene mucho más pagar la multa y seguir funcionando, no les hace nada, sobre todo cuando son grandes empresas internacionales. De modo que, me, reitero, felicito el hecho de que sea administrativa la sanción, pero me preocupa esa parte de la, siendo objetiva, que tenga elementos subjetivos para poderla determinar. Brasil. Ah, muito obrigado, colega do Uruguai. Ah, a questão da responsabilidade objetiva, ela, ela significa que, ah, como, como havia ressaltado, há que se identificar, primeiro, que ocorreu o ato lesivo e que ele foi praticado em benefício da empresa. Ponto. É, e se há necessidade, há essa identificação, é, um segundo processo, e esse sim, concordo, há elementos subjetivos, subjetivos e há, inclusive, estamos inclusive no slide aqui, há uma série de fatores que são considerados, é, é para o montante da pena. A, a responsabilização é no sentido que é necessário ou não se responsabilizar. A questão que, que está sendo colocada aqui é uh, uh, qual o montante da multa. Quanto aplicar de multa diante daquele determinado ato lesivo praticada por aquela determinada empresa. E aí sim, uh, uh, diante dessas características, se avalia o quanto da multa. A questão é... Esses fatores são aplicados no momento de determinar o quantum da multa e não na necessidade ou não de aplicar a multa, que, claro, é de acordo com a responsabilização objetiva que foi falada. Não sei se expliquei... Uh... 
explicar, explicaste, no estoy de acuerdo con eso, <ríe> simplemente. Pero vamos a dejar allí el asunto porque la ley ya es, es ley y ojalá la puedan aplicar bien como corresponde, ¿verdad? Que no les dé el trabajo que les dio la de acceso a la información, que todavía no sé si ya está vigente, todavía no, no entró ya. Bueno. La ley ya está vigente. Ya. Felicitaciones de nuevo. <ríe> Estados Unidos. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll join in saying muito obrigado for the uh, very clear and interesting presentation. Um, one thing I wondered uh, is uh, when we have developed our uh, laws on liability of legal persons, particularly for foreign bribery, uh, we've done a lot of consultation first with the private sector. And then when we've adopted those laws, um, we've done a lot of outreach, a lot of education of the private sector to inform them um, because we want them to comply and um, to make them aware of the benefits of developing uh, integrity measures like you described in compliance programs. Um, so I wondered whether uh, Brazil had undertaken similar consultations and whether you're working sort of proactively with the private sector as you look at the implementation of the law and, and what measures you've used to do so. Brasil. É, sim, nós estamos trabalhando, uh, muito obrigado pela pergunta é, inicialmente, nós estamos trabalhando é, é, de perto com, com o setor privado, de fato o relacionamento é, no Brasil do governo com o setor privado tem se desenvolvido muito nos últimos anos, é, creio que eu mesmo já apresentei aqui uma, um projeto da, da, da CGU, que é o Cadastro Proética, o Cadastro de Empresas Proética, e, e esse diálogo governo-setor uh, privado tem se desenvolvido nos últimos anos uh, e tem sido bastante construtivo. Nós temos ouvido diversos escutado diversas opiniões, tomado notas, trocado ideias, uh, inclusive a própria lei, Durante o trâmite no Congresso Nacional, houve diversas audiências públicas com a participação de representantes do setor privado, com a participação de acadêmicos uh, para se discutir as questões jurídicas envolvidas. Uh, enfim, então, uh, está sendo, sim, é, feito amplo debate no Brasil sobre o assunto. É, com relação à capacitação, é, julgamos que é da, de suma importância que se faça essa capacitação dos servidores públicos que vão atuar e a conscientização das empresas que agora é, 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 devem observar a legislação. É, nós temos no Brasil uma série de empresas que já atuam no exterior e, portanto, já estão submetidas a, a legislações de outros países, como a do, da, do próprio Estados Unidos, uh, e que já tem um, 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 um mecanismos avançados de compliance, que, que já tem um segmento interessante é, é, desse tipo de, 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 de medidas e, 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 e já estão bastante avançadas, mas nós temos no Brasil também como, como ressaltado pequenas empresas, que nós não estamos falando apenas aqui de, de suborno transnacional, mas estamos falando de, 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 de responsabilidade de pessoas jurídicas contra também a administração pública nacional. Nós temos diversas empresas é, é, pequenas empresas que atuam com, no, com, com, com o governo e nós precisamos chegar e conversar também com essas pequenas empresas. Então, uh, uh, muito obrigado é, 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 pelo, 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 por reforçar algo que, que realmente nós já estamos pensando, é de suma importância envolver o setor privado nesse processo, porque é, não, não há que se dizer que, 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 que o setor privado não pode ajudar, muito pelo contrário. Eles podem nos trazer questões, é, trazer pontos que precisam ser melhor é, é, elucidados. Nós teremos a regulamentação dessa lei no, no âmbito do Poder Executivo Federal. Então, todos esses procedimentos de aplicação de multa, essas questões serão detalhadas. O que, que se entende de um programa de compliance, por exemplo? Isso vai ser detalhado no, 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 no decreto. Então, é muito importante envolver todos esses atores na discussão. É, é, não há dúvidas que eles têm uma contribuição muito grande nesse processo e que que uh, uh, o debate é, vai ser a, será muito útil para que a lei não seja uma lei no papel, seja uma lei que seja aplicada de forma, de forma efetiva. Tá? É, e com relação aos programas de compliance, é, é, é só 
é, reforçando, a ideia é que se mensure programas de compliance que sejam efetivos, né? não apenas programas de compliance que, que estejam, uh, não apenas a prova que a empresa tem um canal de denúncia, que a empresa tem isso, tem aquilo, mas que, e diante de um caso concreto, a, a empresa cons, consiga identificar de forma célere a, 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 a irregularidade, tratar de forma célere, punir as pessoas internamente que estão envolvidas e contribuir e colaborar com o governo da forma adequada. Muito obrigado pela pergunta. Eu quisiera fazer-lhe uma pergunta a Brasil respeito a esta lei que, dicho se me passou também, me uno a las felicitações formuladas. Eh, como en algún momento también lo he comentado, desde Perú estamos nosotros en la misma línea de trabajar y sacar una ley eh, y estamos justo en ese proceso de trabajo en el Congreso. Pero mi, mi pregunta iba al, al siguiente punto y es que cuando ustedes hablan de la responsabilidad civil de las personas jurídicas, pero estamos entendiendo que es cuando eh, se vulnera alguna de las normas que están contenidas en la Convención eh, contra la Corrupción de las Naciones Unidas. Y el proceso en el cual se identifica o se de determina la infracción, la vulneración de una de estas normas, se da en el marco de un proceso penal. Entonces, eh, lo que no me queda claro es... Eh, ¿Quién es el que establece finalmente la aplicación de la, de la sanción? Eh, ¿Si es en el ámbito penal o es en el ámbito civil? El escopo, tanto do, do, da responsabilización administrativa como civil, es el mismo. Es la ocurrencia de un acto lesivo definido en el artigo 5 de nuestra ley. Entonces, por ejemplo, si hubo un caso de suborno, é, de um funcionário público estrangeiro tá? é, e, e, e se identificou que foi em interesse da empresa abre-se um processo administrativo para a responsabilização da empresa e o processo civil ele é entendido como complementar porque ele dispõe de penalidades mais drásticas ou, 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 ou mais fortes, digamos assim e, e pode ser aberto a qualquer momento é, o processo administrativo ele é conduzido pelo órgão tese lesado, nesse caso em concreto pela CGU, que tem a responsabilidade por, por processar é, atos uh, uh, contra funcionários públicos estrangeiros, e o processo civil é no âmbito judicial. Ele é judicial. É, é feito uma, a, 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 conduzido pelo Ministério Público e, 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 e é uma questão judicial, não é administrativa. Tá? É, as penalidades são diferentes, o processo é distinto, uh, o rito, uh, 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 os procedimentos são distintos. Uh, o foco principal da, da nossa lei, pode-se dizer, é a responsabilização administrativa. A, a civil é possível, sim, ela é entendida como subsidiária da, da, da administrativa, mas ela tem um processo específico, importante dizer que no, nos casos em que há uma omissão da autoridade administrativa em conduzir o processo administrativo, as penalidades do processo administrativo podem, inclusive, ser aplicadas no âmbito do judiciário, no âmbito da responsabilização civil. Então, há, inclusive, essa previsão na nossa lei. Eu não sei se fui claro, é, é, podemos conversar com mais detalhes, porque é, creio que é, existem diversas particularidades do nosso sistema jurídico que, que devem ser é, bem entendidas, mas, de uma forma geral, é, é isso. Os procedimentos são distintos, um é interno, aplicado pelos órgãos, sem prejuízo, é importante dizer, os princípios da, do contraditório, ampla defesa, e nós já temos uma experiência com relação a isso em processos administrativos, inclusive de punição de, 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 de servidores públicos, uh, e a responsabilidade civil é entendida como, como subsidiária, complementar, é, é, inclusive penalidades mais graves como dissolução da empresa só podem ser aplicadas pelo judiciário. Ok, muchas gracias. Bueno, nos quedaba en estos últimos minutos, gracias Brasil, eh, nos quedaban en estos, eh, en estos últimos minutos escuchar a la representación de, de México y una de Perú muy corta, pero el tiempo nos ha ganado ya, no creo que vayamos a poder terminar con toda la holgura que quisiéramos, entonces le pediríamos a México, por favor, lo pasamos para mañana temprano en la mañana para no tener que cortar
su presentación y mucho menos constreñir los tiempos para las preguntas que puedan haber. Entonces, eh, nos quedaríamos el día de hoy a, a, aquí en este punto y retomamos la sesión el día de mañana. Muchas gracias.